Good morning. Namaste to all of you. Let's start our Sunday class with this Gita Dhyanams. Om Parthaye Pratibodhitam Bhagavata Narayan Swayam Vyase Nagratitam Puran Munina Madhye Mahabharatam Advaita Mritvarshini Bhagavati Mashtadasha Dhyayani Ambatva Manu Sandhami Bhagavata Gita Bhaktivashini Namo astute vyas vishal dute, pul arvind ayat patra later. Yena tavya bharat tel purna, vajvalito gyan mea fadita. Parpan pari jata e to travetre ekapane. Gyan mudra e krishna e gita amri duyen maha. Sarvop nishdo gavo, togata go pale landana. Parto vatsa sudir bogta. Dugadam Gita Amritam Mahat Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kansachanur Mardanam Devaki Parmanam Krishna Mavande Jagatkaram Bishma Drone Tata Jadra Chala Ganda Nilotala Shale Gravati Kripen Vani Karnen Vela Kula Ashavatam Vikar Nagor Makra Driodan Avartani So Tirna Kalupan Dweiranadi Kavartaka Keshava Para share what Saro Jamalam Gita earth and dot come. Nana Kyanak Kesram, Hari Katasam Bodhan Abodham, Loke Sajan Shepadere, Epi Mana Muda, Uyat Bharat Pankajam, Kalimal Patwan Sina Shayase, Mukam Karoti Vachalam, Pangum Langyat Egirim, Yat Kripatam Vande, Permanand Madham. Yam Brambarun Indri Rudramarta, Sunvanti Divies the way. Way they sang Padkamuk Nishade, Gayanti Yamasamaka. The Anavas did that Gatena Manasa, Pashanti Yam Yogino, Yasantam Navidusur Asurgana, Deva et Sme Nama. We are in Chapter Thirteen, Shetar Kshetra Gibhagi or towards the end of it. So we're going to look at the verse number 24 today. And we saw that Lord Krishna has been uh, talking about the self-knowledge. And now from this verse, uh, and the next verse also, he's showing us uh, the different paths for that self-knowledge. Walking we must do. Learning we must do, practice we must do, but he's showing us the paths. So let's look at verse number 24 in your books. Dhyanena atmani pashyanti, kechit atmanam atmana, anye sankhena yogena, karam yogena cha apare, dhyanena by meditation. Atmani in the self. Pashyanti beholds Kechit Sama Atmanam the self, Atmana by the self. Anne means others, Sankhen Yogen by the yoga of knowledge. Karam Yogen by Karam Yoga. Cha means and apare others. So Lord Krishna is saying that some by meditation behold the self in the self by the self. Others by the yoga of knowledge and others by karam yoga. So various roads, they all converge at the same goal. So each path is the fittest for the one who's walking it. No path can be said to be nobler than the other. It's almost like we go to the pharmacy, there's so many medicines. We cannot say this medicine is better than the other medicine. The medicine prescribed for a given disease is the fittest medicine for that patient. As long as that patient's ailment gets cured. 
So the difference between the various seekers uh, is the difference uh, in their mental equanimity and intellectual equipoise. We all know that variety is the universal characteristic of God's creation. No two leaves of a tree are alike. They say that no two snowflakes are alike. No two human beings have exactly the same fingerprints. No two human societies have the same features. The fulfillment of any endeavor involving knowledge, action, love, etc., is when it is combined with devotion or the pleasure of God. So if we keep that in mind when we are walking on the path, we'll reach the goal. So by meditation, some behold the self. So some people can meditate very easily. Meditation consists in withdrawing by concentration. All the sense organs away from the respective sense objects. You withdraw that mind and intellect also, not just the senses alone, then you contemplate on the highest. For some people, it's very easy. They can have a continuous, unbroken thought flow like a stream of flowing oil. In order to pursue this path, naturally the individual must have a dynamic head and heart. There cannot be any disturbance in the mind and the intellect. And remember this behold word, Pashyati, does not mean to see the self as an object. Because then it would mean something against the very assertion of the scriptures. Self is the subject. So that's why the term behold means an inward experience of a total subjective rediscovery. And this experience becomes so vivid that it is comparable to our unshakable knowledge of anything after we have once objectively seen it ourselves. So by the self in the self, This subjective experience of the very core of our personality is accomplished by the head in the pure heart. So that means this is a path of quietening the mind, steadying the intellect. And with that integrated mind and intellect, when we contemplate steadily upon the transcendental self, this is what he's talking about, and it's not available to all. That's why the best type of seekers, the seekers who have sufficient detachment, the ragge, from the sense objects, and then they have a viveka also, discrimination, to distinguish what is permanent and what is temporary. Those are the seekers can very easily meditate. So by meditation, some behold the self, by the self, in the self. Then he says, others by the path of yoga of knowledge. Some of us cannot meditate. So that means we got to bring the required amount of steadiness in our mind and intellect. So remedy is a study of the scriptures. 
So Sankhi over here means uh, the sequence of logical thoughts through which we can reach a definite philosophical conclusion. After that, there's no doubt. After studying these scriptures, having full faith in them, that is the knowledge. So deep study and reflection because it will provide us with a better understanding of the text. So reflection has to be part of the study. We got to have a deeper conviction of the goal. And then we will discover a very healthy and steady self-application and a divine equipoise during our meditation. So this will ultimately take a person to yoga, the union. And if a person can't even study the scriptures, what is available for them? He says, others again by karam yoga. So that means there's a still another type of seekers for whom even study of the scriptures and effective reflection upon it is almost impossible. They are in a state of mental agitation in which no dynamic and effective meditation is possible or any deeper study. That means the instrument is not fit for it yet. So Lord Krishna says the selfless activity in a spirit of yagya. I am prescribing or the Vedas are prescribing. This is called a path of action. When the path of action is pursued for a time, the existing vasanas exhaust themselves. So person is active because of the presence of the vasanas, the deeper impressions. So we got to exhaust those so that there's a more tranquility, more quietude. Only then a mind will get steady and it's fit for delving into the deeper significance of the mantras. And when the conviction of the goal is intensified in the individual, his meditation gathers a momentum. And he will make a dash towards the highest peaks. So in summary, you can say about this verse that seekers with the sattvic qualities, the noblest qualities, need only practice and meditation. Because Purity is there. Calmness is there. Sattvic life makes us meditate very easily. That's why ever since we were little, we were told eat sattvic, exercise sattvic. Keep the environment sattvic. Keep your thoughts sattvic. That was the reason. So seekers with the noblest sattvic qualities only need to practice meditation, dhyana. They'll have the self-knowledge. It's not that meditation, just sitting in the meditation, no. Meditation will take you there. Meditation is again a technique. Just like a karam yoga is a technique. Meditation is a technique. Seekers, of a slight sattvic temperament with some agitations in the mind must develop the creative stillness through the path of perfection. So that means keep on increasing the sattvic depth in you and control your agitations also. Then he says, those who are suffering from the worst mental oscillations created by the vasanas disturbances use the karam yoga. 
develop sattvic traits, nurture and nourish them through reflection. Then enough sattvic dynamism and steady meditation a person can do. So that's why we always talk about uh, we are neither completely sattvic nor completely rajasic or tamasic. We are combination of it. So in our daily life, we should meditate also. We should study also, reflect also, and do the seva also. If you do all of it, we'll see the growth towards that higher, much faster. But what path is prescribed for those who are steeped in tamas? That means they neither want to meditate, nor want to learn, nor want to do selfless service. What should they do? Lord Krishna says in the next verse, Anne tu evam ajananta, shrutva anne bhya upasate, te apicha atita ranti, evam rityum shruti prayana. Anne others. Tu means indeed, evam das, ajananta, not knowing, shrutva, having heard, anne bhya from others. Upasate, worship. Te means they api also cha and atitaranti cross beyond. Ev means even mrityum, death, shruti prayana, regarding what they have heard as their supreme refuge. Others also, not knowing this, that means the previous three paths. Worship, having heard of it from others, they too cross beyond death if they would regard what they have heard as their supreme refuge. So the previous verse defines the path that is conducive to the best type of the students. In our scriptures, they call it Uttamadhikari. And to the mediocres, the Madhyam Adhikari. Now Lord Krishna is prescribing a path for the others, even lower than that. He says, having heard from others. So they are not capable of meditating. They neither have the intellectual capacity to follow the logical thoughts in any philosophy or they don't even have an inward equipoise to follow the path of action. They really don't know how to do the selfless service. Even such people can evolve. If only they worship the principle of truth on the strength of what they have heard from others. Yeah. They heard it. In the Vedic tradition, hearing from the saints has been highly emphasized as a powerful tool for spiritual elevation. When we hear from a proper source, we develop authentic knowledge of spirituality. <clears throat> Another thing happens uh, when we hear something from the saints. Uh, saintly people, they have a lot of enthusiasm. So the ent enthusiasm of a guru or a saint for spiritual activity brushes onto us. Enthusiasm and faith in the heart are the foundation stones on which this palace of devotion stands. He says they to go beyond death. The term death we should not understand as meaning only the phenomena of death that happens to a personality expressed in the body. 
the term used has a very beautiful significance. It has an expanse of meaning, the after death. That means the total principle of change as experienced by any given human mind and intellect. That death, that means death. As long as we identify with the body, whether it's a gross body, subtle body or a causal body, the experiences can only be of the finite. To experience the infinite is to enter the status of immortality. And that's what Amrit means. Amrit means that Amrit, deathlessness. That's what he says, they to go beyond death. That doesn't mean that their body doesn't die, but they realize who they are. So this verse uh, is explaining the efficacy of prayer and worship. Even when it is performed unscientifically. All we are doing is just following somebody with a full faith and full enthusiasm. So all the methods he's giving us are equally efficient. But he is emphasizing the idea that in the practice of worship, correct knowledge shall surely provide a better guarantee of success also. So even a worship following somebody. So others also not knowing this, not knowing the other paths, worship. But this line over here, that if they would regard what they have heard as their supreme refuge, that is the key part there. They got to have that kind of understanding. So through these various paths available, what exactly is the ultimate goal to be realized? That is in the next verse. Yavat sanjayate kinchit. Sattvam sthavar jangamam kshetar kshetragye sanyogat tatu vidhi bharat rishab yavat whatever sanjayate is born kinchit any sattvam being sathavar jangamam the unmoving and the moving kshetra kshetragye Field and the knower of the field. Sanyogat. Union. From the union. So together it means from the union between the field and the knower of the field. And we've been learning these terms in this chapter. That means that Vidhi no Bharat Rishab, O best of the Bharats. And we know that is Par Arjan. So Lord Krishna says, whenever any being is born, the moving or the unmoving. Know you, O best of the Bharats, that it is from the union between the field and the knower of the field. Kshetar Kshetragye Sayyogata. So all things in the world that are born, both the world of the inert matter, that is unmoving, and the world of conscious beings moving. They arise neither from the Prakriti, the field, nor from the Purusha, the lower of the field. The source is from the marriage of Prakriti and the Purusha. So this combination of matter and spirit is not an accomplished union but it is only a mutual superimposition. This is what Sanyog is over here. Superimposition, we know this term. In every superimposition, a delusion is recognized upon a substratum. 
that is a superimposition whether we superimpose a snake on the rope it was never a snake it was always a rope but we superimposed the snake on it or if we see a post it's a post but we just in the twilight we think it's a ghost we superimposed ghost on the post so its existence uh, the snake's existence or the ghost existence is not there it resulted only from the mutual exchange and we find that non existent uh, ghost or the snake to exist in our experience and that existing rope or the post become non existent for us this process uh, which is like a trick to the human mind is called mutual superimposition so the trick in the mind in the pure consciousness there is no field of matter the field of matter has neither existence nor its sentient but the spirit plays in the field and becomes the knower of the field purush and when this purush works in prakriti the combination breeds the entire phenomenal universe constitute moving and the unmoving it's almost like a ordinarily if a person says i am a quiet person but sometimes my heart passion is endless when i identify myself with the passion in my heart i play in the world as a passionate person and even the deeds are passionate the person says later on i find myself that i'm regretting i'm not that but how did i behave like that so in this example the regret and the regretting person the passion and the passionate entity all of them revel in that person they all belong to that person but he is not they but when a person identifies with all this he becomes the perpetrator of the regrettable actions and the passionate actor and later on comes to brood over what has happened so it suffers similarly the self contains matter possibilities the self bring very poor and complete but it just projects like that that's how this sansar is made so to analyze closely with the discrimination to detach courageously with vitality carefully we got to observe all of this we cannot allow ourselves to be misled by our own imaginations and that is the method of realizing the perfection in our self and that's what he is saying over here that whenever any being is born the unmoving or the moving know you o best of the bharat that it is from the union between the field and the knower of the field so all of this superimposition we got to remember we are not that we are here to know ourselves whether we can do it right now with the path of meditation can't then study if we can't study to the selfless activities if we can do that follow somebody wholeheartedly you will reach at the same place if you hold or let the person hold your hand 
the sometimes our hand can be slip away but if we just have a full faith and hold the hand or the feet we will reach there that's what is telling us <clears throat> and the self which is the substratum of a given purush and prakriti is itself the one self everywhere so that means there is no difference between the atma and the paramatma let's look at how he says that in the next verse samam sarveshu bhuteshu tishthantam parmeshwaram vinashyatsu avinashyantam ya pashyati sa pashyati samam equally sarveshu in all bhuteshu in beings tishthantam existing parmeshwaram the supreme lord vinashyatsu among the perishing avinashyantam the unperishing yo means who pashyati sees so means he pashyati sees he sees who sees the supreme lord existing equally in all beings the unperishing within the perishing so now he is stating that it's not enough to see the presence of the soul within your body we must also appreciate that god the supreme soul is seated within all bodies samam sarveshu bhuteshu so the substratum that supports all is the supreme lord remaining the same in all beings same and that is undying in the dying because to a superficial observer the world is a field of perpetual change a constant death <clears throat> nothing remains the same that's why this common saying among philosophers you cannot see a tree that same tree again as you looked at it if you look at it again after a few moments it has changed constant changing so nothing remains the same even for a moment things change themselves and naturally their relationships with each other also change we observe this change in this world <clears throat> we perceive it through our senses even in our feelings and even in the field of thoughts we know that they all change but the absolute truth is indicated over here as changeless avinashyantam unperishing that is the platform that is the substratum that's where all the changes are taking place so everything in the phenomenal world is subject to modifications or the change like birth growth disease decay and death these are the changes the modifications or the vikar we call them so the entire chain of modifications when do they start from the birth of something that's why lord krishna said earlier <clears throat> that which is born alone can grow and ultimately passing through the various changes reach the final change the death so when the supreme lord is indicated here as the deathless all other modifications are also denied in him that means no birth no growth no disease no decay and definitely no death so no changes in atma or parmatma 
this changeless consciousness which supports all the changes is the undying principle that illumines the ever dying world of polarity <clears throat> and a person who is capable of recognizing this this supreme lord supreme lord <clears throat> who revels everywhere as the pure spirit that means in all the names and the forms who changes not while the outer equipment change he alone is the one who sees what is really to be seen and this is what spiritual realization is we want to become self realized soul realized this is what we need to see this is what we need to experience among the changes that which does not change everywhere the physical world is recognized and perceived through our physical equipments that means through our senses the physical body emotions in the world around us are felt and recognized by our minds we are familiar with that and the world of ideas is comprehended by our intellect the spiritual substratum in the universe of beings and things can be apprehended only by the spiritual center in ourselves just like eyes cannot see the thoughts the same way the equipments of perception feelings thoughts cannot recognize the soul grosser cannot see the subtler we can experience the subtler by transcending the grosser that's why in our meditations what do we do close our eyes close our ears draw all the attention inward somebody might say why do we put the music on in the true meditation no music it's just like when a little child starts to walk need some kind of help to hold walk or a finger of a mother or a father later on child is a meet it so in meditation the same way in the beginning you might put some music some form something to bring your attention in world but ultimately true meditation you don't need anything then he says he alone sees who sees this this is a very powerful and a direct assertion everybody sees but not the real because wrong perceptions indicate mal adjustment in the instruments of perception that's why we call them sometimes hallucinations illusions false imaginations and delusory projections of the mind because they really veil the reality so when we want to see really he says he alone sees who sees this sees this means over here what he is talking about the eternal or something which does not perish in the perishable that person is truly seeing 
And he who recognizes this harmony of one truth, this one truth means this is the thread of reality which holds all experiences together, which is one in all being, experiences the truth to be realized in the world. Earlier he mentioned it's like a thread in a garland. We see the stones, the gems, but we don't see the thread. Thread is the one which is keeping it together. And this thread over here, he says, it's unperishing. And others, they think that they see it. But if they don't see this, he says, yet they do not see it. He alone sees who realizes the Supreme Lord, which is the imperishable. So now we have to look within. Each time we meditate, each time we study, are we getting a little closer to this reality? Do you feel this? That is something higher than me. Something which is, uh, I cannot see, but I can somehow feel. We have to take our mind to that first and then transcend this mind also. Then in the next verse, he says, Samam Pashyan hi sarvatra, sam avasthitam ishwaram, na hi nasti atmana atmanam tatahayati paramgati. Indeed, he who sees the same Lord everywhere equally dwelling destroys not the self by the self. Therefore, he goes to the highest goal. So this is a continuation of the previous verse and we'll look at it next week. So let's just stop the class here today. Om Purnamada Purnam Idam Purnat Purnam Udachyate Purnase Purnamadai Purnam Eva Vishishyate Om Shanti 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 Om Thank you very much.